All right. Greetings. All right. Well, our next session. Hey, hey, hey Bert. Greetings. Great. Hey, how are you doing? Good. Good. Very well. Um, our next session is with Bert DeVries, Dmitry Bagayev, and Bart Van Erp. It's going to be called Towards User-Friendly Design of Synthetic Active Inference Agents. And I know a lot of people are super excited to see this really practical and cutting-edge work. So to you, Bert, and just let us know how we can support. Okay, great. Uh, well, is, is my audio good? Yep, sounds good. Okay, then I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I hope I picked the right one. I don't work with Zoom quite often. Looks good. It, it, Looks good. Yep. Yeah, all right. Super. Um, well, thanks a lot, uh, Daniel, for for hosting this uh, uh, symposium. I've been uh, watching some talks. It's really amazing, and uh, we really we feel privileged to get a chance to present ourselves. So we are also, just like uh, a few others before us, interested in developing a toolbox for active inference. And so this picture or this, uh, kind of shows what we're, um, uh, what we're uh, about or what we're interested in. So here's a lady on the left-hand side, and um, I'm gonna try to get a laser pointer. And she has this uh, idea about her, uh, rewarding behavior for a vacuum cleaning robot right so she's writing down she has a textual expression move around the apartment apply suction until the floor is clean do not touch objects and when done return to the dog so that that's not so hard i'm going to rate that with one star out of three stars in terms of difficult difficulty level to specify that um, but that's not enough to program this robot right because what she really needs to do now is to specify a generative model and uh, that you know the, there's effectors and actuators right the, the robot has to move around uh, apply suction uh, until the floor is clean so there's sensors probably a camera uh, do not touch objects so maybe there has to be object recognition this is a really difficult task to come up with this generative uh, model here and on top of that she has to specify this kind of rewarding behavior in terms now of probability distributions of this generative model. So very difficult. I'm going to rate that with two stars um, because the next thing she has to do for this model is to specify the inference procedure to do actually uh, active inference and free energy minimization in real time for this complex model. And really, that's almost impossible, right? Only a few specialists can really write a procedure for, for variational free energy minimization in some very difficult model. So what we are about, what we've been working on, is to try to automate the inference task. So get rid of the three stars. And yes, she will still have to specify a model, but in the long term, we try to get away from that. So in the long term, we hope we will get a toolbox. And now we're talking five, 10 years, right? Um, where a textual description would be enough to specify some initial model with an initial prior and everything else is just automated inference learning of states parameters structural adaptation of the model even maybe based on her feedback updating uh, the, the prior um, so that's long term uh, for now we would be very happy if we could just automate the inference uh, uh, task so um, why why is it so difficult to specify inference for an active inference agent? Well, we have so many competing uh, KPIs, right? We we uh, we want to do this for large model scopes, not just for A, B, C, D models, but maybe there's also continuous variables and hierarchical models, right? Uh, it must be very user friendly. We really don't want her to worry about robustness. Um, of her code. Um, we, we don't want her to worry about whether um, two variables are uh, have conjugate relationships, right? Um, adaptivity, we want to update states, parameters, maybe even the model, the model structure it has to be low power because these ancients often run on edge devices, right? So they run on their battery powered. It has to be in real time because you can't learn how to ride a bike if, if there's no real-time reasoning. And on top of that, 
you actually want to minimize variational fidelity, right? You want to do it at least as good or at least in a neighborhood of if you would do a manual derivation. And some of these desiderata bite each other, right? If you uh, you want to minimize variational free energy, but you have to do it in real time and on low power, yeah, that kind of bites each other, right? So these are difficult KPIs that we we, we want to, yeah, we, 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 they're all important. You can't just take one out um, because then the whole system wouldn't work. Um, so um, when you read, papers on active inference, you often also read, and um, now we implement variation of range minimization, and that can be done by message passing on a graph. And um, I want to clarify first why it has to be done by message passing on the graph. Um, I'll do that by giving a very short answer, and then do an example. The short answer is that Bayesian inference involves um, computing very large sum of products, like what you see here on the left-hand side. Here's a product AC, AD, BC, and then we sum them, AC plus AD and so forth. This is a sum of products. Now, we know by the distributive law that this here on the left-hand side can also be computed as on the right-hand side. If I multiply this out, I get A times C plus A times D and so forth. This is a product of sums. And they are exactly the same thing. The only difference is that to compute the left-hand side takes four additions, sorry, four multiplications and three additions. To compute the right-hand side takes two additions and one, only one multiplication. So on the right-hand side is much cheaper to compute than the left-hand side. Normally, when we write down marginalization and Bayesian inference, we, we write things down in the as in the left-hand side. What message passing does on the graph, it will automatically convert that into much cheaper to evaluate product of sums. And I'll give an example of that. Um, so here is an, uh, an example model, f of seven variables, x1, x2, through x7. And this model happens to be factorized, fa of x1, fb, x2, and so forth. Now, we can draw this factorization in, in, as a graph. And what we do, and this is called a Forney-style factor graph, what we do is for each factor, fa, we uh, allocate a node. So fb gets a node and fc gets a node. And we associate the variables in our system with the edge. And an edge is connected to a node if that variable is an argument of that function. So fc is a function of, F, of x1, x2, x3. And that means that fc connects to the edges x1, x2, x3. And fd is only a function of x4. So fd only connects to the edge x4. So what you can see in this graph is this graph is nothing but a visualization of the factorization assumptions that we have for this model. Now, if I'm interested in a big marginalization uh, a task, I uh, integrate out over all variables but x3, so x1, x2, x4, and so forth through x7. I'm interested in this. Um, then making taking advantage of this factorization i can rewrite this sum this basically this um sum of product into um a product of sums as as below here what you will see here below this computes exactly the same thing but i've made use of this distributive law for instance um, FC contains no X4, no X5, so I moved it over the summation sign to the left. And FB also doesn't contain uh, X4, X5, X6, X7, so I moved it all the way to the left. And when you do that, you are left here with um, an expression where I only sum, sum over two, two variables. And here I have to sum over six variables. And here over two, and here over two. So you can imagine if each variable, let's say so x1, x2, if each variable has 10 interesting values that you need to sum over, then I have here 
the original marginalization problem, I have 10 to the power six, so a million terms. And here in red, I have 100 terms. And here I have 100, and here I have 100. So here I have 300 terms, and here I have 1 million terms. So it's, a, it's an enormous reduction in computational complexity when we uh, make use of this distributive law. Now, it turns out that if you write this out, you can associate these, these intermediate factors with messages on the graph. It's just an interpretation, a visual interpretation. It's as if FC receives a message from FA and FB receive, or FC receives a message from, X to, from FB and computes an outgoing message mu X3. And the same thing for FE. So FE receives a message from its neighboring vectors, FD and FF, and computes an outgoing message, um, uh, X3. So what you see here is that the entire marginalization process can be represented as basically computing a few messages on a graph and multiplying some of these messages with each other. And, 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 and that's how you can do Bayesian inference and also how you can do variational free energy minimization. So this works in, um, in factorized models, but I would say even stronger, if your model is not factorized and you have a lot of variables, uh, th there is just no way you can do proper inference. So any serious model is factorized, like the brain is almost sparse, right? is, is, is almost empty. We have, uh, what is it, about 10 billion uh, neurons and uh, each neuron connects to a few thousand other neurons. So if I would draw the graph, that graph is almost empty. It is hugely sparse. And so there is no other way to do inference in the brain than by message passing. Um, so that's why message passing, just because it's more effective than anything else. Now, then the issue is, which message do you compute? How do you compute messages? Um, because there are different ways of doing it, right? And we also read in uh, active inference papers, you can do this by variational message passing or expectation maximization or belief propagation and variational Laplace and all these terms. It turns out that there is a uh, an umbrella framework for all these message passing frameworks. And that umbrella framework is called constraint beta free energy minimization. And um, I, try, I will try to um, illustrate that by, uh, uh, well, by this slide. So here I have this graph. This is a, just an example graph um, where my generative model is basically um, factorized in FA, FB, FC, FD, and FE. And I've also written that here. So this now is the variational free energy. Now, I haven't made any assumption on Q of X. So Q of X is still Q of X1, X2, X3. It's just a joint over all variables. And it doesn't have any factorization assumption. Um, it makes sense to also assume that the posterior kind of follows the factorization assumption of the prior, namely of the generative model. So if we make that assumption, and that means we're going to make the assumption that Qx is also now a product of Qas of, of x of a, where Qas of x of a stands for beliefs over nodes. What I mean by that is that Q of B is a, is a posterior belief over this node, meaning it's a posterior, posterior belief over the edges that connect to this node. Just like FB is a function of X1, X2, X4, that's, if you will, the prior or the generative model, then Q of B, the variational posterior for this node, will also depend on X1, X2, X4, and, and on no other uh, factors. Um, if you just do that, then you will count some of the variables double because X1 is part of the belief over FA, but also part of the belief over FB. So we just have to discount that by dividing by beliefs over edges. That means that I make now an assumption that my posterior beliefs is 
is is divided into local beliefs over nodes and local beliefs over edges over variables this will make things a lot simpler in fact if my graph is a tree and it is a tree here and i would do message passing on that tree and i could suppose i could do that perfectly everything is linear gaussian then i get perfect bayesian inference there, there is no approximation so this is a good assumption sometimes it's still very hard to compute a message because even the 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 the, the single message that come out of these nodes, they're still integrals or summations. And in particular, the integrals may be a problem. We may not have an analytical answer. So what we sometimes do is add additional um, assumptions. We'll say, well, the posterior belief over FD, I can't compute it in general, but I'm, I'm going to just assume now that it's a Gaussian. That makes it easier. Or we can make an extra factorization assumption and say the posterior belief over FB, which is really a belief over the joint X1, X2, X4, is going to be broken into uh, um, independent belief over X1 and a uh, belief over um, X2 and X4. Um, these additional assumptions, if I impose them as well this is what i would call now if i if i if i all substitute that here in q of x i get what's called a constrained beta free energy this is the same beta as in the oppenheimer movie this is hans beta where it's uh, named after and um so we have a graph now that um that is highly factorized um and we have um, local beliefs over nodes and over um, over edges, and they're indicated with uh, with red. And we have additional constraints in green. They could be Gaussians or mean field constraints or other constraints. And now we will assume constraints that make it possible to compute all the messages. And now we can just automate this. By making different assumptions, we can turn this into expectation maximization or belief propagation or um, hybrid forms thereof. We can turn it into any relevant message passing algorithm that you've heard of. So this is a very nice umbrella framework that uh, basically encompasses everything. And uh, um, and there is a, we've written a, a pretty large paper on this um, in, the, in the Entropy Journal where you can read all the math on uh, how this works. So we've talked about why message passing, namely because it's the most effective way of doing it, inference. And we've talked about which messages to compute, namely, we turn our variational free energy into something called a constrained beta free energy, and then we can compute messages. The only thing that's left is, well, when do we pass these messages, right? What is the sequence of messages? Which one comes first? And um, this is where we see a lot of papers, right? Um, um, you have to write control flow. What's called control flow? You have to say, um, okay, here is my algorithm for active inference. First, I specify a model. Then let's do inference for every time step. Collect a new observation. Update the state. Update the desired future, state, and so forth. Compute expected free energy. Select the policy, etc. Um, this kind of program. The problem with active inferences is. There is nested for loops in here. Here's a for loop, and here's another for loop. And for each of these policies, I'm going to have to go into uh, the future. So I'm going to have another time loop. So there's for loops in for loops in for loops. This will completely explode in terms of computational complexity. So as a result, uh, some very clever people have written very clever algorithms of doing this much faster, sophisticated inference. Uh, branching time active inference, dynamic programming, EFE, are recent proposals for doing this very clever. In the end, all of these proposals come down to a particular, just a message passing schedule. Um, once we commit to message passing on the graph as our inference procedure, it's the only thing that's going on. And all of this, sophisticated inference and branching time active inference 
all it does is it schedules the messages. It says th first this message, then this message, then this message. I don't mean that as a slight to these uh, algorithms. They're very clever. And as we've seen in the presentation by Asvin Paul, you get huge improvements if you go from regular inference to sophisticated inference. But it's good to realize that these algorithms just specify in the graph which message comes after which message. Um, so here's an example. Uh, here's an example of uh, a graph and a, and a message um, sequence. Here's uh, message one, then message two, and message three goes up, and then we go from FC to F. F and here's message five, and then we go to FE. And this could correspond this sequence to dynamic time programming EFE or sophisticated inference. Um, there are a couple of problems with this approach, which we basically with, with, with having the user to specify a clever algorithm. First of all, you have to be a specialist to do it, right? Only these are very clever people. So, so that means that um, if we let it, if we leave it to, um, let's say, to an engineer in a company, it's, it's well, it's a high probability he's not going to get it right. That's very unfortunate. Um, but there is another issue, and that is that, in, in a sense, it's a global variable. Um, in the message passing schedule, all nodes are visited. Because if a node would not be visited, then we shouldn't have it in the graph. And that means if one node crashes, Basically, the message passing schedule is invalid. I have to reset my system. And if you fly a drone, if it's deployed and it's out in the field and a node crashes, a, a transistor burns out, and I have to totally reset now my system, I have to compute a new message passing schedule, um, then you're not doing inference and, you're not, and your drone flies into the wall. So this is not robust. And it also, for a very, this, the same reason, we may actually want to uh, take out a node. We, we, we may want to prune a node. We, we may want to, want to do uh, structural adaptation. And we can't do structural adaptation because we have to reset the system, recompute a message passing schedule. So this procedural style where an engineer a priori specifies which message comes after this message uh, has some uh, disadvantages. It's not very robust. And it's uh, if you want to do it very clever, you have to be really a specialist. So a better system is what we call uh, reactive message passing. And um, it's very related to what was in the first session uh, called the uh, the actor model. Uh, Keith Duggar had a, a nice presentation on the actor model. So what we will do is we will say we will not have a global message passing schedule. The engineer will not spe specify anything anymore. The inference code that an engineer will have to write is just say, ah, react to any free energy minimization opportunity. In other words, there is no inference code. It's completely automated. And um, we will replace this global message passing schedule by local triggering inside the node. So each node is now just an autonom autonomous system that's interested in minimizing its free energy. Uh, it can do so by sending out messages. And when will it do so? Well, it, it receives messages. And when it feels, when it looks at these messages and it feels like, oh, there is an opportunity for me to minimize free energy by, or expected free energy by, sending out a message, then we'll send out a message. And each node will do so by itself asynchronously, so you get parallel distributed processing or concurrent processing, as Keith called it. Um, in principle, you could uh, play this game on many uh, computers at the same time. Uh, and uh, so you get tremendous uh, um, advantages. Um, it, first of all, you don't have to write difficult code. Second of all, you can do multi-threading, um, or you can you can uh, run it on multiple computers at the same time, and uh, so do, do, and there's also um, uh, robustness um, um, uh, advantages because if a node crashes, then there's nothing that stops the system from just finding another path, right? If if this node crashes, this path from here's message three, uh, this path now doesn't work, so I can't 
cannot send anything to FE anymore from uh, no from X. Well, then I just sent a new message here. Why not? It's like when water falls down a mountain and it zigzags its way down into the value, and you have where you put up an obstruction. It just finds another path, um, not the preferred path. This has to find well the the second the second best path because the first path has been obstructed right and that's go, that's what's going to happen in this system as well right that's just how nature works it tries to find the best path the easiest path and if that's not available then we do the second best path and that's also what you can do with reactive message passing so you can prune nodes you can do structural adaptation um, and it's far more robust and you can also get uh, let's do um, chance encounters with other drones right drones that get close can start communicating with each other and when they're far away they stop communicating with each other and this is no problem because you can basically change who, who change um nodes can change on the fly who they communicate to and who they want to listen to and uh so that's that's the way nature works and also how it works when we do uh, reactive um, programming and reactive message passing. So in summary, um, we're interested in automating inference in um, uh, active inference agents, right? Um, because it's an operation that's basically only for, for experts. And this, Active inference technology is not going to be successful unless we get more people, uh, unless we democratize it and we get competent engineers being able to develop good agents, right? You shouldn't have to be a top specialist in the world to, co to develop an active inference agent. Now, in order to automate inference, you must do message passing. And I've talked about that for efficiency. I've also talked about which messages to pass. Not necessarily do you have to follow this framework, but constraint better free energy framework is very convenient. It's an umbrella framework that basically um, goes over um, all the interesting other uh, um, uh, message passing uh, computations. When message passing, reactive message passing. It's fully automated, so you don't have to write any code anymore. In principle, it's, it's you can do parallel distributed processing. It's robust to structural changes. You can learn new inference pathways. So lots of lots of advantages here. Now, how do we do it? Um, I'd like to introduce a toolbox that we've been working on uh, called RxInfer. And we do that with uh, my lab here at the university. I'm here in Eindhoven in the south of the Netherlands. And we have a lab. The lab is called Bayes Lab. Here are uh, um, postdocs and assistant professors and uh, PhD students. And we've been working on this for many years. And some of these, uh, um, uh, like Albert and Ismail and Thijs, um, have uh, written dissertations. Um, and uh, our best work, we have consolidated that in a toolbox. And the toolbox is called RxInfer. And you can, if you want to have a look, you can go to the website, rxinfer.ml. Um, and rxinfer works uh, in the way that I've just discussed. It does message passing. It tries to minimize constraint better free energy. That means it, it can come up with all kinds of uh, message passing algorithms. Um, um, uh, it will do it in a reactive way and uh, it will try to do it in real time and low power and all the KPIs that we're talking about. Now, it's of course not done, but um, it's functional and uh, I'd like to show some demos and I will uh, leave it to Dimitri and Bart, who are two advanced PhD students in my lab to sh show the demos. So I'm going to stop sharing awesome thank you bert great talk sure uh can you hear me uh, yeah, yeah 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 okay i will try to share my screen okay so you should see it now looks good okay
So yeah, hello uh, to everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Dmitry Bakayev. So I'm a PhD student in Lab in Eindhoven University of Technology. Uh, and yes, I have a small presentation about uh, actual software developments in Lab. And yeah, so all, over uh, the past few years, we have significantly improved our tools. And basically my entire PhD was dedicated to implement the, this idea which uh, Bert was talking about. Uh, like implementing the variation of reactive message passing. And in this presentation, I just want to show you what you can actually do uh, using this theory under the hood. Uh, okay, so basically in order to automate active inference, right, we need to automate Bayesian inference. And we have uh, we have already a lot of solutions for that, uh, such as Stan, Pyro, NumPyro, which is funded by Google, Infer.net is funded by Microsoft, Turing is in Julia, PyMC, and many, many, many. So, uh, and basically these solutions are really, really good. So, uh, and they're really good at prototyping as well. But our goal uh, is eventually to be able to deploy this kind of systems, not just prototype. And we are really focusing on these particular properties for this automated Bayesian inference. Uh, so it must be uh, low power, adaptive, real time, scalable. It also must be user friendly at the end and it must support a large scope of models if you want uh, it to be useful. Uh, so um, in Bias Lab, we, we want to build such a software uh, with such nice uh, properties. Uh, and it's always about trade-offs, right? So we do something better in one particular domain and maybe other software libraries, they might be better in a different domain. So, but we are really focusing on these particular properties. Uh, and so, yes, uh, I will reiterate a little bit Bert's presentation. So how do we achieve this? So we have, imagine we have an environment and we have an agent uh, and the agent allowed to take some actions and the agent, basically what he needs is to come up with some sort of good enough probabilistic model of its environment uh, in order to do Bayesian inference. Uh, and in our framework, we encode the model as a factor graph, which not only models the observations, uh, but also actions and desired future. Uh, and this uh, this approach allows us to decompose the these complex relationships between variables and hidden states into some kind of structure and local blocks. Uh, and it's not a block uh, it's not a black box anymore. So uh, and the model itself may have some sort of background motivation interpretation. It may encode your prior knowledge about the, some particular physical system. Uh, and the lo locality of these blocks basically allows you to scale to millions of variables and hidden states. It allows you to pre-optimize it maybe, or maybe use like some sort of different approximation strategies in different places. Uh, so it, it allows a lot of very nice properties as well. And we use reactive message passing to run uh, actual variational Bayesian inference. Uh, it uses reactive programming under the hood to minimize the approximation to the variational free energy. Uh, and yes, as Bert also mentioned, it's, it's, it's very much related to actor model. Uh, uh, and basically in Rx and Fur, you can think of different nodes as actors themselves. Uh, so, and they have basically one single purpose is to send a variational message that minimizes free energy. Uh, this is a very short and very high level description, but it is essentially what is happening under the hood. So we, we are not treating different agents uh, which interact with each other as actors, but we also treat the, the, the actual components of the underlying model as actors themselves. It's like a very hierarchical structure. So this is the main central idea of, uh, of this inference. Uh, so here, for example, a first example, we can do an inference in a dynamical system. And this example, which is quite old already, I think it's like two years uh, ago. So we, we, we track a position of the object given some noisy measurements, which are indicated by green dots. Uh, the actual uh, real signal, uh, we cannot observe it, but we just can plot it, uh, is shown as blue. Uh, and the inferred signal is shown as red. And the data set is infinite. Uh, the inference engine just reacts on it and does not assume on, on any particular data size, uh, simply reacts on your observation as soon as possible. Uh, yeah, I'm actually not sure how smoothly Zoom shares my screen. Uh, maybe you can see it a bit lagging in the animations. I'm not sure because maybe Zoom does not share it on a full frame rate. 
Um, and also on the right hand side, you can see how we define models uh, in our uh, framework. We use Joomla as a programming language. Um, and so basically this is everything that you need to define this particular model and run inference on a data set. And actually I like literally spend more days to plot it instead of inference, right? So inference was, was an easier, easiest part for me. Plotting was very much harder to relate to user friendliness. Uh, so, and we actually have plans to improve uh, our model specification language, make it even easier. So for now for technical reasons, we have some uh, auxiliary statements in the model specification language, but we, we are working to improve uh, that and make it even easier. Uh, this is another example, which is similar to the previous one, but uses much more complex and linear dynamical system of the double pendulum. And the system is uh, chaotic uh, and we can observe only a small part of it, uh, with a lot of noise also indicated as a green dots. Uh, and nevertheless, given uh, given good enough model, uh, you can infer uh, the, the other hidden states with pretty much high precision and the code needed for that is also relatively short. Uh, and yeah, we also have uh, examples with active inference agents uh, that interact with their environment. Uh, so the left, uh, uh, the left up shows uh, yeah mountain car problem, very famous problem. The left bottom side shows uh, an active inference agent which uh, tries to control the inverted pendulum from falling in the windy conditions. It reacts on wind. We also have a demo of an agent that controls a pendulum in an ever-changing environment. So on the right side, you see a pendulum with an engine, and the engine has, uh, engine has limited power, uh, and the agent itself needs to reach the goal. And the goal is uh, indicated as a red circle. So and Basically, in this demo, we can change the environment in real time and see how the agent reacts. So we can change the mass of the pendulum on its length or the amount of noise uh, in the measurements, or we can change the goal, we can change maximum engine power, etc. Right? So the agent will still try to infer uh, the best possible course of actions in order to reach its goal. And it, it, it just never stops reacting. Um, it's, it's also actually possible to restrict engine power such that it, it will no not longer possible to reach the goal right but the agent will still try uh, we have other cool demos with smart navigation and collision avoidance uh, which are still under active research and the code for them is not available publicly it will be soon available but for example in this uh, example uh, we can define a set of agents with their boundaries in a set of their destinations so and we can see how they try to resolve their routes all together um, and we can have some static obstacles in the map uh, we can see how agents can find their most optimal path uh, in order to reach their goals uh, and avoid uh, any possible collision and it's also not necessary to have static obstacles uh the obstacles themselves may move so in this demo we have hundreds of agents that navigate through a map of obstacles that move from bottom to top so the circles are obstacles and agents are uh, depicted as uh, small dots and they need to go from left to right basically avoid any sort of pollution uh, and as i also mentioned we want to perform efficient and real-time inference but we also do it like low power, low performance, uh, on low performance devices such as uh, Raspberry Pi or Cool Pi, as an example. And we have some results of successfully running uh, the Bayesian audio source separation, for example, on Cool Pi. So it is actually possible. Uh, we also run active, uh, we try to run active inference uh, agents uh, also on Cool Pi. Uh, so uh, as the aforementioned inverted pendulum. Uh, and as I mentioned, we, we also need to uh, have a large model scope. And basically, Rx Infer has not been designed to solve any of the aforementioned problems specifically. Uh, we have a large set of different examples in our repository, uh, different models, different data, different inference constraints. Uh, we have examples for linear regression, hidden Markov model, autoregressive model, hierarchy models, mixture models. 
Gaussian process and, and so on, so right? So this approach is very versatile. And for example, if you um, if you compare it with sort of a conventional software libraries, where you let's say have a library that solves a common filter, might be a very great library, maybe super fast, have top performance, works great and very reliable, uh, it's super good. But then you are constrained by by this particular model, common filtering, right? And you can't really change it much. Uh, in our software, we we are free to define our own models, uh, which we can pretty much easily define a model that essentially would act equivalently to common filtering equation. And so basically in the demo that I showed before about uh, object tracking, it was essentially a common filter that was written in a, in a probabilistic model. Uh, so yeah, that was my small uh, addition to Bear's presentation. So our software is free. It's so, um, MIT license and it's open source, available on GitHub. Uh, yeah, and we would be happy, uh, thanks to be able to present, we, are, we would be happy to answer uh, any questions. Thanks. Awesome. Awesome. All right, I'll just ask a quick question in the chat. Marco asks, sorry if I missed it, are the collision avoidance demos real-time adapting to other agents' behavior, or is it a collectively pre-computed path? Um, so basically, they are not uh, super real-time. They're kind of fast to compute this path, like maybe five seconds or so. Uh, but we are basically working to make it real-time. So we know what is the problem. We know uh, where to improve, uh, and we will make it real-time. Yes, Almost, Ooh. almost like Next question, do you have some comparative data with other methods and just more generally, what kinds of benchmarks or what do you, when you're talking with industry in different settings, what are people like looking for that killer app of active inference or what are they looking for their key measures? Uh, so I personally have a big paper about uh, comparison with uh, sampling based methods like HMC. Uh, and also in my PhD thesis, well, uh, there will be a comparison with NUTS, also other sampling-based methods. Uh, so long story short, sampling-based methods cannot really run uh, this kind of sophisticated inference in real time. Uh, they are very time consuming. They do not really scale well to large problems, which is really needed for active inference agents, because if you have like large environment, very complicated, you will have, you will have a lot of unknown variables in your model. Uh, so, yeah, so there is a paper that compares, uh, and basically we show that, yeah, our approach scales much, much better. So I personally run on just a, just a regular MacBook, uh, laptop. I run the model with 2 million, uh, uh unknown variables. And it was like quite, quite fast. And then, and if with sampling based methods, you may you may find yourself in a model with like 100 variables and then you wait like two hours or something and then it, it turns out that your chain did not converge so uh or something like that cool yeah it's um people commenting in the chat like how far message passing and factor graphs have come and so to to bias lab and to bert at all we definitely appreciate this exciting line of research i mean there's so much to learn there and sometimes looking at the equations it can seem like it's like written in stone and just sort of the beginning and the end is you know variational free energy but then in your presentations you're really showing like no we we are hands-on that's where we get the interpretability the modularity that's where it really is implemented and it's like an information logistics challenge it's not like an esoteric philosophy question at that point. No, no, in, in, indeed. And I mean, I I should say it's uh, it, it's taken us, uh, I mean, we are no geniuses, right? So uh, our lab exists more than eight years and, and you see all the people in the lab. It's taken us many, many, many years with lots of wrong directions to get this to work to where it's now. So it's a, it's a very long path, but the the, at, at this moment, I'm pretty confident that at some point in the future, and I don't want to put a, a, 
we don't want to say in three months or one year, but it, it, we will be able to write a toolbox that will allow people to design a generative model and just press a button. And, and, and forget about the inference. You don't have to worry about inference anymore. It will be fast and automated, and that will happen, and it will happen within a few years. And, uh, and, and maybe somebody else will write an even better toolbox, but I'm pretty confident that even our, our toolbox um, um, will be able to do that. So, um, and I think that, yeah, you know, people talk about, uh, so why don't we have the success of deep learning and generative AI, right? Well, they, if they have the success because of big data, availability of big data, big computers and toolboxes, TensorFlow and all the successes. We don't need big data because agents collect their own data on, on in the field. We don't need big computers. Active interest agents, you know, they, they manage their power resources, but we need a really good toolbox uh, because programming an active inference agent, programming the inference by hand is just not doable. Um, so we need an, an, a really good toolbox that really automates this. We hope uh, our Simfer will be one of the first toolboxes to do that. I am sure that other people uh, are, will also be working on it and, and better toolboxes will come about. Um, but I think the, the optimistic message is that it will happen, right? Uh, and, and once we have a toolbox like that, then we can actually, a, a large community can start building agents and we can actually show uh, deployable agents in the field, right? That they work and they work better than a reinforcement learning agent or whatever is out there, right? Um, so that's, I think that's a very positive and, and hopeful message. It's what we expect. It's what we prefer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any last comments from either of you? Um, from comments from us? No, no, no. We just, I'm just very happy to, uh, well, to get the opportunity. And uh, yeah, I want to. Uh, so, yeah, um, everybody can download this toolbox. Um, I think you st at this moment you still should be a, a programmer to work with the toolbox. And I hope you're friendly because you know it's not uh, totally polished in the way that we want, but it's coming, right? It's coming in the next years. There will be a good toolbox for, for almost everybody to use. But people that are interested, uh, even people that are interested to work here at Bias Lab, we have an open position uh, for PhD students. So uh, um, we're, we're happy to uh, yeah, to receive emails from people that are interested to have to work with us. Thank you. Dimitri, anything in closing? No, just uh, thank you yeah, again to, uh, for our possibility to present. Super nice to be here. Cool. Yeah, well, later in the year, we will be discussing your two-part recent work. And so we're going to be getting a lot into the details. And I, I hope that people in the Institute and the ecosystem will be as excited as we all are. Super. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. All right. For the next interval, we are.